before even the first rising of the sun, before the creation of the moon, before the race of men even existed in Middle-earth, there were dwarves in Khazad Doom. For close to 10,000 years, they prospered, they grew wealthy, they delved vast halls, and they turned Khazad Doom into a great wonder of the northern world. Until the day came when everything changed. The lights of Khazad Doom went dark. The dwarves departed, their king was killed, and a nameless fear awoke. So, how did it happen? What went wrong? And how exactly did Durin's Bane turn the splendor of Khazad Doom into the Black Pit of Moria? Maya, Govan, and Melanine, and welcome to another Tolkien Untangled Middle-Earth lore video. Today I'll be talking about the Balrog of Moria, the nameless fear Durin's Bane, who pretty single-handedly conquered what could be considered the most unconquerable kingdom anywhere in Middle-Earth. Now, it's impossible to say exactly how old Khazad Doom is, as we're never given any date for its founding, but we do know that it was founded at some point way back in the years of starlight, before the sun and the moon existed, and before many of the most iconic events of the First Age took place. Even by the most conservative low-end estimation, Khazad Doom is super old, and there simply is no other place in Middle-earth that stood so strong during the First, Second, and Third Ages. During the First Age, Khazad Doom was discovered and then delved by Durin the Deathless, aka the first dwarf ever. And although it played no significant role in the main events of the First Age, by the end of that age its population was reinforced and its strength was reinvigorated by a massive influx of First Age Dwarfs from Beleriand fleeing the ruin of that now drowned land. And so, in the Second Age, Khazad Doom reached the absolute pinnacle of its might and its wealth and its splendour. Under the rule of King Durin III, there was a rare yet profound friendship between the dwarves of Khazad Doom and the neighboring elvish realm of Eregion, which lasted up until the total destruction of Eregion during the War of the Elves and Sauron. Following that devastating conflict, Khazad Doom became a far more isolationist place. The doors of Durin were shut and the dwarves of Durin's folk secluded themselves from the outside world almost entirely. The alliance of dwarves and elves broke apart, and so too did the alliance of dwarves and men. A few dwarves from Khazad Doom did fight in the War of the Last Alliance to overthrow Sauron at the end of the Second Age, but for the most part, the goings on in Khazad Doom were almost entirely unknown to outsiders. Even the dwarves of the Iron Hills were sundered from their kin beneath the Misty Mountains. But if there were one word to encapsulate what the dwarves of Khazad Doom were getting up to during these dark years of self-imposed isolation, that word would be Mithril. In the words of Gandalf the Grey, the wealth of Moria was not in gold and jewels, the toys of the dwarves, nor in iron, their servant. For here alone in the world was found Moria Silver, or true silver as some have called it, Mithril. Its worth was ten times that of gold. The dwarves tell no tale, but even as Mithril was the foundation of their wealth, so also it was their destruction. They delved too greedily and too deep, and disturbed that from which they fled. 
Now, just before I continue, there are two fun facts to mention here. First, we are told that after the dwarves abandoned Khazad Doom, nearly all of the mithril that the dwarves had mined was collected by the invading orcs and given in tribute to Sauron. So we can safely speculate that at the time of the Lord of the Rings, somewhere in Barad-dûr, there was probably a vast stash of ill-gotten mithril to be reclaimed upon Sauron's final downfall. And the second fun fact is that Gandalf is actually mistaken when he says that here alone in the world was found Mithril. You see, in the unfinished tales there is a throwaway line about Mithril being found within the island of Numenor. Anyway, even as Mithril was the foundation of their wealth, so also it was their destruction. For the purposes of this video, that is the key sentence. They delved too greedily and too deep and disturbed that from which they fled. Now, just before I go on, I want to quickly thank the sponsor of this video. This video is brought to you by FlexiSpot. FlexiSpot is a company that specializes in making high quality furniture to suit any and all home office needs. And they've been kind enough to send me a standing desk to show you guys. Standing desks are awesome, I truly believe that, and since acquiring one, my productivity has improved immensely. All of FlexiSpot's standing desks are totally adjustable, so with just the push of a button you can swiftly set your workspace to whatever height you require, whether you be a hobbit or an ent. And not only do FlexiSpot offer a flash sale every single Wednesday, but they are also currently running a spring sale where you can get up to a third off. These desks are quiet, they take a lot of weight, they are super easy to put together, and of course they are totally customizable in size and style and colour. So if you're looking to upgrade your workspace or your gaming space, Space, I do highly recommend FlexiSpot standing desks. It genuinely is an asset to the production of this channel and these videos. Anyway, in the year 1981 of the Third Age, so just over a thousand years before Frodo would set off on his journey towards Mount Doom, the king of Khazad Doom was King Durin the Sixth. And it is, of course, for King Durin the Sixth that Durin's bane gets his name. When King Durin the Sixth was 249 years old, the dwarves of Khazad Doom delved deeper down towards the roots of the mountains than they had ever delved before. And in these ancient depths, those dwarves encountered a monster, a nameless Fear, a being of shadow and flame that was unleashed upon their home. What exactly this monster was, no dwarf could say, but it brought utter ruin upon Khazad Doom. It unleashed terror upon the dwarven mansions above, and it slew the great king Durin the Sick. From that day forward, the demon beneath Khazad Doom was known simply as Durin's Bane. Now, there is definitely more to talk about here, but before I get into it, I think we need to jump back in time a good few thousand years, 5,422 years to be precise, because 5,422 years before the death of Durin the Sixth, there came a final victory in the Cataclysmic War of Wrath, the war that brought the First Age to an end. In that war, Morgoth, the Dark Lord, was finally overthrown, his fortress was laid bare, his armies were defeated, and his servants scattered. The greatest of all the Dark Lord's dragons was slain in this war, the most iconic of all his servants, Sauron, mysteriously uh, disappeared into the east, and as far as we know, every single one of Morgoth's Balrogs was either already dead by this point, or was destroyed in the War of Wrath, except for one. Actually, I will say that the number of Balrogs ever to exist, and thus the number of Balrogs that could have survived beyond the First Age, 
is a very tricky thing to pin down. Balrog's changed a lot over the span of Tolkien's lifetime, and there is some compelling evidence to suggest that more than one Balrog may have survived the downfall of Morgoth, but there's also plenty of evidence to suggest that this may not be the case. The truth is we simply don't know. Although, in a note from one of Tolkien's later writings, we are told that of the Balrogs, there should not be supposed more than, say, three, or at most seven ever existed. So, it's unlikely, I guess, that Tolkien intended for many Balrogs to be kicking around in the Third Age, but it is possible that Durin's Bane wasn't totally alone. Anyway, just before we get to the question of how Durin's Bane came to dwell in the deep places beneath Khazad Doom, first I want to examine a few sentences that explain where this character came from. Like all Balrogs, Durin's Bane was a fallen Maiar, sort of like an angel in Tolkien's mythology, a being of the same order as Sauron, or even Gandalf before he was bound in the body of an old man. Which means that his life began in the timeless halls before even the music of creation. Durin's Bane is thus older than the universe. In fact, he was probably part of that music of creation. He was there in the very, very beginning, but in the very, very beginning, he fell to the dark side. He became a servant of Morgoths, who back then was called Melkor. In the Valaquenta, we are told that of the Maiar, many were drawn to Melkor's splendor in the days of his greatness and remained in that allegiance down into his darkness. Dreadful among these spirits were the Valaraukar, the scourges of fire that in the Middle Earth were called the Balrogs, demons of terror. Along with the rest of these Balrogs, Durin's Bane would have been present for many key moments of the First Age, he was almost certainly complicit in the killing of Feanor, that's the super elf who created the Silmarils. He presumably fought in most, if not all, of the great battles of that age, and we can speculate that he was probably an active participant in the downfall of Gondolin. We aren't given any details about him specifically, so it is all speculation, but the Balrogs in general are described by Tolkien as primeval spirits of destroying fire chief servants of the primeval dark power of the First Age. They had whips of flame and hearts of fire, and they were cloaked in darkness, and terror went before them. So, the point I'm trying to make is that Durin's Bane is very much not the kind of being that you would want to stumble upon while digging for Mithril. He is one of the very few beings still going in the Third Age who actually could bring an end to the seemingly indomitable majesty of Khazad Doom. But the next question is, how did he get there? Khazad Doom is a long way from where all the drama of the First Age was taking place, and of all the places that this Balrog could flee to, why bury itself in the roots of the Misty Mountains? Well, again, Tolkien doesn't give us an explicit answer to this question, but he does give us enough details to work with. And I guess the first of those details is that the Misty Mountains are not like any other mountain range. They were raised after the other great ranges. They are younger than other mountains in Middle-earth, and they were raised with an evil purpose by the Dark Lord Melkor himself. So, perhaps Durin's Bane was, in some way, either consciously or subconsciously, aware of this. Perhaps he was drawn to those foundations of stone because they were one of the very last vestiges of Melkor's ancient evil still to exist in Middle-earth after the War of Wrath and the end of the First Age. But then the next question is, why weren't the dwarves aware of his coming? We know that Durin's folk had been slowly excavating Khazad Doom throughout the First Age, and Durin's Bane didn't get there until the very end of that age, so how did he go so unnoticed for so many 
thousands of years? Well, to answer that question, we need to consider the size of Khazad Doom relative to the size of the mountains that it exists within. No doubt, by the Third Age, Khazad Doom was huge. And even back in the First Age, I'm sure it wasn't small, but it also wasn't quite as big as three of the mightiest mountains in one of the mightiest mountain ranges in Middle Earth. The three mountains of Moria are, in the Elvish tongue, Karadhras, Fanuidol, and Kelebdil, or in the Dwarvish tongue, Barazimba, Bundushathur, and Ziraxigil. But it would appear that the majority of Khazad Doom exists within the southernmost of those three mountains, Ziraxigil. In fact, it's on the peak of Ziraxigil that Durin's Bane will eventually be smited and cast down by Gandalf. But that is right at the top of the mountain, and to answer our question, we need to look downward to the deepest depths and the uttermost foundations of stone. In the Silmarillion, we are told that after the War of Wrath, Durin's Bane fled the downfall of his master, and he hid himself in caverns inaccessible at the roots of the earth. And in The Lord of the Rings, these inaccessibly deep caverns are expanded upon by Gimli and Gandalf. When the three hunters reunite with Gandalf the White in Fangorn Forest, Gimli states, Deep is the abyss that is spanned by Durin's bridge, and none has measured it. To which Gandalf replies, Yet it has a bottom, beyond light and knowledge. Thither I came at last, to the uttermost foundations of stone. We fought far under the living earth, where time is not counted, that's Gandalf and Durin's Bane fighting, till at last he fled into dark tunnels. They were not made by Durin's folk, Gimli, son of Glowin, far, far below the deepest delvings of the dwarves, the world is gnawed by nameless things. I have walked there, but I will bring no report to darken the light of day. In that despair, my enemy was my only hope, and I pursued him. Thus, he brought me back at last to the secret ways of Khazad Doom. Too well he knew them all. So, this dialogue implies that the chasm beneath the bridge of Khazad Doom was not delved by the dwarves, and it confirms that beneath the deepest delvings of Khazad Doom, within the uttermost foundations of the earth, the roots of the mountain, there are other, darker tunnels gnawed by nameless things. Now, these nameless things that dwell beneath Moria are up there with, like, Tom Bombadil for being one of the most enigmatic parts of Tolkien's writings. They are mind-blowingly mysterious. However, if I were to talk about them now, it would probably derail this whole video. But I think we can confidently speculate that these ancient evil tunnels that were not delved by Durin's folk may very well have been where Durin's bane sought sanctuary for all those millennia between the downfall of Melkor and his awakening in the Third Age. And so, I guess it is finally time to talk about that awakening. 5,422 years after the end of the First Age, Durin the Sixth was the king of Khazad Doom, and, as had been the case for millennia before, his people were very busy mining Mithril. Deeper and deeper they delved, following the silver veins further and further down towards the uttermost foundations of stone. Until, on one fateful day, they roused from its slumber a nameless fear. Unwittingly, they awoke a Balrog. Now, we are given frustratingly few details about what went down as the Balrog woke up, but we know that one of the first things he did was slay Durin the Sixth, and thus acquire the epithet of Durin's 
Spain. After the death of King Durin, his kingdom was inherited by his son, a dwarf called Nain. But then Nain was also slain by this nameless fear of shadow and flame. Many, many other dwarves of Khazad Doom were slain also, and eventually the dwarf halls of Durin the Deathless were fully abandoned by his descendants. The great mansions of Khazad Doom became known as the Black Pit of Moria. However, what I find very, very interesting is that Nain, son of Durin, was slain one year after his father. Which means, although we know next to nothing about it, there was potentially a whole year in which King Nain and his dwarves remained in Khazad Doom, presumably fighting the Balrog and doing all in their power to defend their ancestral home from conquest, from its downfall. And what a fascinating year that must have been. The mightiest dwarves of the mightiest dwarven settlement holding off a Balrog of Morgoth for potentially up to a whole year. But, of course, this was not a conflict the dwarves were destined to win. And after the death of King Nain, Moria became the dominion of Durin's Bane. The dwarves fled, but the consequences of this nameless fear's awakening were not limited simply to Durin's folk. Within a metaphorical stone's throw of Moria's great gate in the east, there dwelt a sylvan population of wood elves. Elves who would in later days dwell deep inside the golden wood of Lothlorien. In fact, it was due to the awakening of this nameless fear beneath the mountains that many of these elves fled south into their woods and removed themselves from any and all proximity with what they now considered the evil blackness within the Misty Mountains. In fact, a good number of them travelled west and journeyed across the sea to leave Middle-earth entirely. And I think the awakening of Durin's Bane is a big part of explaining why the elves that did remain in this part of the world, the Galadhrim, adopted such an isolationist attitude in the latter half of the Third Age, and particularly had such a distrust of dwarves. I mean, they had absolutely no idea what this nameless fear was, except that it was terrifying, and it was, in their mind, unleashed upon the world by dwarvish greed. Anyway, after the Balrog awoke, he became the de facto Lord of Moria. Although, for 500 years or so, he was pretty much alone in there. But then, in the year 2460, Sauron returned to Dol Guladur from the Unknown East. Twenty years after that, he sent a great host of orcs and trolls into the Misty Mountains to block the passes and prevent his enemies from easily crossing between east and west. And of course, many of these orcs and trolls found their way into Moria, where they no doubt came into contact with Durin's Bane. And this brings us to another very, very interesting question. To what extent was Sauron aware of Durin's Bane? And why was there no formal alliance between them? After all, Sauron is in Dol Guldur, the Balrog is in Moria, those places are pretty close to each other in the grand scheme of things, and yet neither Sauron nor Durin's Bane ever introduced themselves to the other. I guess there are a number of potential answers here. It is very possible that Sauron simply did not know that one of Melkor's former top dogs was hanging out on his proverbial doorstep in Moria, and I imagine it's actually kind of likely that Durin's Bane would not know that Sauron had replaced Melkor as the new Dark Lord. In the deepest depths beneath the mountain, Durin's Bane was probably pretty out of the loop. 
And yet, I would suggest there is another potential facet to this answer that I find really fascinating to think about. Because, of course, back in the First Age, when Durin's Bane was just another one of Melkor's Balrogs, Sauron wasn't really a lord of anything. He and the Balrogs both served the same master, but there is no story of the First Age where they were united side by side. The Balrogs were Melkor's super warriors, but Sauron really wasn't. He was a sorcerer, a deceiver, a master of phantoms and werewolves and vampires, but the lord of the Balrogs was Gothmog. And so, even if Sauron and Durin's Bane were fully aware of each other after the latter's awakening, I'm just not sure to what extent they would actually want an alliance. I really don't believe that Durin's Bane would submit to serving Sauron, especially absent the One Ring, and I also don't believe that Sauron would really have much to gain by inviting a potential rival into his inner circle, not relative to what he could end up losing. Durin's Bane is perhaps the closest thing that Sauron has to an equal in the Third Age, and as we all know, the Lord of the Rings does not share power. And at the end of the day, if it came down to the Necromancer of Dol Guldur versus the Balrog of Moria, I don't think it's easy to declare which one of them would win. So perhaps Sauron just kind of let the Nameless Fear be. Durin's Bane had unknowingly benefited the Dark Lord very much by bringing down Khazad Doom, and so maybe Sauron saw no advantage in pushing his luck any further. Tolkien tells us that Sauron called Shelob his cat. He saw her as a useful pet, not a servant, but a free agent that he could rely upon to guard the pass of Kirith Ungol. So, maybe Sauron saw Durin's Bane as being a bit more like a rabid dog, useful for biting his enemies, but too dangerous to be engaged with in an actual partnership. Anyway, this all finally brings us to Durin's Bane's Bane, aka Gandalf. 1,038 years after the death of Durin VI and the beginning of the end of Khazad Doom, Gandalf led the Fellowship of the Ring inside Moria, and then 12 days after that, he died, killing the Balrog. In Peter Jackson's movies, it's pretty much stated that Pippin is responsible for making the Balrog aware of the Fellowship, and in the books, Pippin does drop a stone down a well, but it's not in the Chamber of Marzabul, it's actually the day before the Balrog shows himself, and I think there is much more to this than simply Pippin's poor decision making. The night before the Fellowship enter Moria, they try to cross the mountain Karathras, the mightiest of the mountains of Moria. As I'm sure you know, there they encountered a snowstorm. They suffer the cruel will of the mountain, and in order to save the Fellowship from, I guess, death by cold, Gandalf reluctantly breaks his own rule regarding secrecy, and he issues a magical word of command that causes a spout of green and blue flame to appear and to warm his freezing friends. However, after doing this, Gandalf laments, if there are any to see, then I at least am revealed to them. I have written, Gandalf is here, in signs that all can read from Rivendell to the mouths of Anduin. And then, in the early hours of the very same day that the Fellowship do enter Moria, Gandalf is forced to use his fire magic once again. And this time, it is considerably more intense. While the Fellowship is under attack from evil wargs, Gandalf seemed suddenly to grow. He rose up, a great menacing shape like the monument of some ancient king of stone set upon a hill. Stooping like a cloud, 
he lifted a burning branch. It flared with a sudden white radiance like lightning, and his voice rolled like thunder. Once again, Gandalf invokes a magical word of command, and the tree above him burst into a leaf and bloom of blinding flame. The fire leapt from treetop to treetop, the whole hill was crowned with dazzling light. So, whilst being very, very close to Moria, Gandalf unleashed his fiery Maiar magic twice. And although I can't claim that this is a fact, Tolkien never stated so in like a letter or anything, I am inclined to believe that Gandalf's revelation of his power, you know, his fire-based Maiar magic, is not irrelevant in explaining why another Maiar with fire-based magic became aware of him. The One Ring is probably also a factor, it does seem that the Watcher in the Water was drawn to the power of the Ring, and also Pippin Stone definitely didn't help, but I would argue that, potentially, it was the power of Gandalf himself that truly caught the attention of Durin's Bane. And, okay, it is possible that I am taking this speculation a little bit too far here, but there is at least some more evidence to suggest that Gandalf's fiery Maiar powers, and the Balrog's fiery Maiar powers, represent sort of two sides of the same coin. When these two characters face off against each other on the bridge of Khazad Doom, Gandalf says to Durin's Bane, I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor, the dark fire will not avail you, flame of Udun. In this single sentence, we have four references to fire. Two of them pertain to a good kind of fire that Gandalf identifies with himself. The secret fire is the source of Eru Iluvatar's ability to create life. It is the thing that Melkor coveted most, but was never able to get his hands on. And the flame of Anor is almost certainly a reference to Narya the elvish ring of fire that Gandalf keeps, but he also identifies the Balrog with two references to evil dark fire. And I do really like this idea that Gandalf and Durin's Bane have quite a thematically intimate bond, yet they kind of represent each other's opposite. Perhaps by the Third Age, only Gandalf could kill the Balrog, and perhaps only the Balrog could kill Gandalf. As it goes, they both succeed in doing just that. So, let me end this video by quickly recounting exactly how this final battle went. How did Durin's Bane finally meet his end? Well, as you know, it began with both Gandalf and Durin's Bane falling together. In Gandalf's own words, Long I fell and he fell with me. His fire was about me, I was burned. Then we plunged into the deep water and all was dark. Cold it was as the tide of death. Almost it froze my heart. He was with me still. His fire was quenched, but now he was a thing of slime, stronger than a strangling snake. We fought far under the living earth, where time is not counted. Ever he clutched me, and ever I hewed him, till at last he fled into dark tunnels, gnawed by nameless things. In that despair, my enemy was my only hope, and I pursued him, clutching at his heel. Thus he brought me back at last to the secret ways of Khazad Doom. Ever up now we went, until we came to the endless stair. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak it climbed, until it issued at last on the peak of Xeraxigil, also known as Celebdil, and out he sprang. And even as I came behind, he burst into new flame. Lightning, they said, smote upon Celebdil, and leaped back broken into tongues of fire. A great smoke rose about us, vapour and steam. Ice fell like rain, 
I threw down my enemy, and he fell from the high place and broke the mountain side where he smote it in his ruin. So, from this colourful description, we frustratingly get no details about exactly how Gandalf killed the Balrog, he just threw him down. But we do get some very cool details about Durin's Bane himself. When his fire is quenched, he seems to become a very different type of demon. A strong thing of slime, compared to a strangling snake. But then, for the final battle, he burst into new flame. And we see a lot of elemental language used to describe the setting of this ultimate showdown. Lightning breaking into tongues of fire, ice falling like rain, and eventually the body of the Balrog breaking the mountain side in his ruin. Five and a half thousand years after the defeat of Melkor, five and a half thousand years after Durin's bane fled and sought sanctuary beneath the Misty Mountains, he finally faced the defeat that he'd been forestalling for so long. Just like Sauron and Saruman a few months later, the spirit of Durin's Bane was no doubt left naked and powerless in Middle-earth, unable to go west, but unable to depart the circles of the world. That was his punishment for rebelling against Iluvatar and following Melkor. To exist forever but with nothing. But his enemy, Gandalf, his spirit was rehoused. He was sent back, for he had Iluvatar on his side, and his task was not yet done. I guess we often think of Saruman as being the character who represents the antithesis of Gandalf, or like the anti-Gandalf. And to an extent, maybe he is, although actually I would argue that Saruman represents more of an anti-Radagast than he does an anti-Gandalf, so perhaps the case can be made that if Gandalf does have, like, a personal nemesis, a character in the story who is his equal but opposite, then I would say that character is his fellow fire-themed Maiar, the Maiar that he killed, and the Maiar that killed him. Durin's Bane. Anyway, that is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of it. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit like and leave a comment, and hit subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss any future Tolkien lore videos to come. However, until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Navire Melanine.